This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. Okay, for this episode, it's all about pop-up market trends. So yes, I am talking about cars that have flip-up headlights. Either you love them or hate them. I, I actually, in between, I grew up with them. I'm starting to really like them. My dad absolutely hates them, uh, but I got to appreciate them. And now I'm not just talking about the uh, Diablos and F40s and Testarossas, which I will have those in this episode. Uh, I'm talking more about the folks that are collecting the Trans Ams or the Fieros or the Supras, and they're starting to come together to celebrate the pop-up headlights of the era from the 1980s. So be sure to listen to the end of this episode as I will review the top 10 fastest pop-up headlight cars ever built. So that's when we'll get into some of those supercars. But first off, I wanted to mention that, you know what? I think the market is slowing quite a bit. I do go over a lot of market trends here, specifically around pop-up headlights. And I'm not gonna get the numbers exactly right here, but let's say of the 20 cars I review, all 20 except for one of them, uh, the recent one-year market trend is a lot slower than the three-year market trend. A lot of times the three-year was pretty strong, either double digits or in one or two cases, triple digits. And not that it's gone negative, but it slowed up a tremendous amount down to 5%, zero, flat, or whatever. There was only one car, which is actually, I think, our second one on the list, that was up more the latest one year than it was the latest three years. So we'll get to that in a second. Okay, now let's see. I have covered a lot of market trends recently, so I'm not going to cover if I just covered you know one of these cars. I'm not going to cover again if I just covered it in one of the most recent podcast episodes. So I won't have the market trends for the Lamborghini Countach, the F40, the Maserati, uh, Ghibli, the Testarossa, the Pantera, because I just covered those. So... I am going to focus on post-1975 cars, and I will pick out the hottest versions for the one- and three-year market trends. Well, I'll try to pick out the hottest versions for the one- and three-year market trends. I don't always know the exact specific model on some of these cars, but I know I picked out the hot ones for a few of them. Uh, So as an example, so Corvettes, they have like the record for the longest uh, the most years of having pop-up headlights. They go from 1963 with the C2 Corvette all the way up to 2004. So you're talking 41 years of pop-up headlights. So I'm not going to review C2s or C3s, but I will review the C4s and I will provide the market trend for the Z06 of that generation. So that's just a for example. All right, now this is from Hot Cars. Dot com. Now, if you're joining me online, you'll notice I do have a really old car who did have pop-up headlights. And this is actually the very first car we'll cover here in a second. It was also the very first car with mass-produced pop-up headlights. All right. From hotcars.com, pop-up headlights, also known as flip-by, hideaway, or hidden headlights, headlamps, debuted in 1935 on the Cord 810, which is the picture I have in front of you. At the time they were hand cranked, a power pop up headlights came later in GM's, GM's concept car, the Buick Y Job. But it took a while to, become, to come in a production vehicle, the 1962 Lotus Elan. Uh, I am going to flip through some pictures here because for this Cord 810, if you go on YouTube, I do want to show you the crank uh, pop up headlight. Uh, it looks just like a window crank. Uh, but it says retractable headlamp. So you actually have to go all the way to the right to do the right headlight. You have to go all the way to the left to do the right headlight. And they are actually located on the uh, the dash of the car. So that's pretty cool. I believe they were cable actuated, uh, accentuated. All right. Over time, the popularity of the pop headlight has waned, although they were the norm on all fast sports cars from the 1960s right up to the 1990s. 
Post that, pedestrian safety also frowned upon anything that protruded from the body of a car, and so they were phased out. More recently, in the second millennium, some cars like, like the Toyota AE86 JDM car uses pop-up headlights as a way to bypass U.S. import regulations on car height. All right, so like I said, I'm going to mostly focus on post-1975 cars, but I had to get the granddaddy in here. And I'm flipping through the pictures now from rmsotheby's.com. The one I'm showing now was sold last or this year at the Amelia Island auction. So 1936 or 1935 to 1937 Cord 810 Uh Let's see. The one-year Haggerty trend is 5.9 percent. The three-point, the three-year Haggerty trend is also up 5.9 percent. All right. For our second car. Now this is a really cool car and the example I have pulled up here is very cool as well. If you're watching online, it's a 1993 BMW 850 CSI. Now what's cool about the one I'm showing a picture of, it was the very first 850 CSI to be produced. And it was cool because if you looked at the VIN, it did end in like 0001, which was really, really cool. I'll see if I can pull that picture up here in a second. So the 1990 to 1999 BMW 8 series, like I said, this one is a 1993 I have up for uh, market trends. The one-year trend is up 16.8%, and the three-year trend is up 8.4%. So that's the example. Uh, I think it's the only one. We'll find out here shortly. But that's the example uh, where the one-year trend is actually stronger than the three-year trend. Now, if you're online, you will see I have pulled up the VIN, and it does end in a 00001. And I believe this car sold for around $235,000, which sounds like a lot when you consider it has about 35,000 miles on it. But <clears throat> it is the very first one. There is only one, and it was in absolutely fantastic, unbelievable condition. And it has the, uh, it doesn't say Motorola, but like the Motorola period phone from 1993 in the dash there. So very, very cool. All right, next. The next one we have is a car that is very close to my heart, and it is wicked and bad looking. The 1993, I'm sorry, the 1989 to 1993 Vector W8. Uh, this thing looks like a Mako Shark on wheels. I have a purple one pulled up. Uh, there'll be a picture of a red one later in this presentation. Uh, okay, so the, the trend on this, uh, from a 1991 Vector W8 is flat, latest one year, and actually latest three years is also flat. So I did want to read a little bit about this. I have gone deep in vectors recently. It wasn't a podcast episode, but if you go on, actually, yeah, it was a couple weeks ago, America Supercar, if you want to know more about the vectors, I interviewed quite a few experts and owners uh, at the Win uh, Las Vegas Concord Elegance. It was a lot of fun, and we went pretty deep in it. All right, from R.M. Sotheby's, the 1990s saw the birth of several audacious supercar manufacturers who attempted to beat Ferrari, Lamborghini, and Porsche at their own game. Among the more compelling companies was Wilmington, California's Vector, which was established by Gerald Weigert, an automotive industry veteran, veteran with experience at each of the big three in Detroit. Now, he recently passed away, I believe two years ago, uh, and his son was actually at the Las Vegas Concord, and he was very nice. Very nice to talk to him for a little bit. All right, so these things are wicked. They're twin turbo V8. Uh, let's see, a Vector W8 could run the quarter mile in 12 seconds at 124 miles per hour, which was over two seconds faster than the Ferrari Testarossa. No surprise there. Zero to 60 time was 4.2 seconds. The company even claimed it could reach a projected top speed of 242 miles per hour. Now, if you want to see one of these and actually do a spin around the interior cockpit, go to my YouTube channel, check out, uh, actually it was on, it was on um, Instagram, go to my reels. I actually have this cool little 360 camera where I went inside a second gen vector, the M12, and did a 360 so you could see what the interior looked like and then went into the W8 that was next to it as well. So if you want to see what these cars look like, uh, be sure to check that out. Okay, next we have a very controversial car uh, for a couple of different reasons. Let me pull it up here. The 1976 to 1989 Asta 
Aston Martin Lagonda. Now, when you see this car, uh, it's a big four-door wedge-shaped, really cool-looking car. I actually think they're fairly beautiful. And it looks like the headlights are not pop-up because it has small headlights right above either side of the grille above the bumper. Well, that would not be true. Those are actually fog lights, and it does have pop-up headlights right be behind that. So if you never put the headlights up, it's absolutely gorgeous. You put the headlights up, it's not as pretty. Now, there is a lot of plastic black catting. Uh, the one I'm showing right now is a 1984 version that was sold down in uh, RM Sotheby's Fort Lauderdale sale. I have always thought they were really cool, but they are quite a handful. So per Haggerty, in their, in their day, Lagondas were the darlings of the Novu, Novu Rich pop stars and Arab sheiks who were inclined to colors like candy apple red with a lime green vinyl top, white puffy leather inside, and gold plated mag wheels. Uh, let's see. At least the sheiks could cope with eight miles per gallon. Some thought the cars were vulgar and they remain divisive automobiles even today. A total of 645 Aston Martin Lagondas were sold in about 11 years, but a small percentage of those are roadworthy today. The very best cars with full provenance and all records are absolutely the ones to buy as deferred maintenance and general neglect will likely make for more headache than it's worth. Now that's per Haggerty. Now this one, it has just a crazy uh, digital dash. It has the big Motorola phone, phone hanging on the side. It has a cool steering wheel with like kind of one spoke, uh, wide one spoke for the steering, steering wheel. Uh, very cool. Haggerty one year trend is flat and Haggerty's three year trend is up 10.2%. So another example where these have cooled significantly uh, recently. I think the biggest issue with these are parts, electronics, trim pieces, you know, just about anything. So if you're looking at one of these, you just need to go ahead and buy the best one out there because otherwise it's going to be a big old headache. All right, next we have the 1978 to 1981 BMW M1. Now the Haggerty trend on this from 1979 example is up 5.3%. Three-year trend is up 12.2. So again, a 7% difference in the last two, three years. Like all good things in life, BMW's motivation to build the M1 came from motorsport. The Mark's aging CSLs were no match for Porsche's new uh, 935, and BMW needed a mid-engine chassis to fit to fit its twin cam 3.5 liter six cylinder engine. All right, all right. BMW's motorsport division contacted Lamborghini for help to homologation help in homologating the proposed car, as 400 examples were needed. Now that was per the RM Sotheby's description on the car I'm showing online. online. Uh, beautiful 1980 BMW M1. All right, next we're gonna move back to the Corvettes. Like I said before, Corvettes, longest running <laughs> pop-up headlight uh, car out there. I apologize, I don't have a better picture here. 41 years from 1963 to 2004. Uh, this is for the C4 Corvette, which, uh, you know, ended in 2004, started in 1984, technically. I'm sorry, not 1984, uh, later than that, 1994 maybe? Anyways, I know you will correct me on this. Uh, the market trend for the 2003 Chevrolet Corvette Z06, one year trend up 29.7%, so very strong on the Z06. Three year trend up 41.7%. So again, you have over a 10 year, a 10% gap between the one year and the three year. All right, moving on, let's go to one of my favorite cars. And this example I'm showing online right now is one I know very, very well. Uh, let's see, It's these were built from 1990 to 2001, at least the pop-up headlight versions were. Online, I have a beautiful 2000 Acura NSX-T in a rare Monaco blue, one of just 21 finished in Monaco blue over black leather for the year 2000. This was actually the first NSX I ever drove. This one had less than 19,000 miles on it. Stunning, stunning car. All right, for the market trends, I chose a 2001 NSX-T with a 3.0 liter engine. One year trend is up 5.1%. The three year trend up 27.2%. So a huge 22% gap between one year and three years on these, just showing how much 
uh, they have slowed down in the marketplace, which isn't all bad because I want to be able to have an NSX. If they keep going up in price, I will not be able to have an NSX. All right, the next one, and I do not have a picture of it, but I picked the Mazda Miata. And for the Haggerty Trends, I picked a 2005 Mazda Mazda Speed MX-5 Miata. Latest one-year trend up 17.9%. Latest three-year trends up 47.6%. So a massive 30% gap between the one and the three-year trend. Now, I know there's some hotter versions out there. I didn't really dig through the database too much to try to find it. Uh, I think there's even a Club Sport. I know there's a couple really rare Mazdas out there. You want to have some of the earlier ones. All right, next is somewhat unheralded. The 1982 to 1992 Toyota Supra. So a lot of us have seen 1993s and later, but what about the ones prior to 1993? They're not getting a lot of love right now. Well, I say that in the market they are, but they're just nowhere close uh, to what the later ones were. And they're pretty cars. They're not as beautiful as or as nice looking as the uh, later models. So uh, for this example, for the Haggerty Market Trends, I picked a 1992. Uh, Toyota Super Mark III Turbo, one-year trend is up a strong 37.9%. But here's the big one, the three-year trend up 105.8%, almost a 70% gap between the three-year and the one-year. Now, these are still somewhat affordable, so they're not anywhere close to the uh, later versions that are, you know, 100, 150 grand. These are still well below 50 grand, typically. Uh, get them while you can. I would love to have a 1986 Toyota. Uh, I think then it was called a Celica Turbo, if I'm not mistaken. In high school, my buddy had one, and uh, it was five-speed, dark blue. Uh, loved the wheels on those cars, and we would tear around in that thing like crazy. And I absolutely love to have one of those. If I can find a dark blue one, that would be perfect. All right, next, we're going to move to the 1982 to 2002 Pontiac Firebird. Now, this is multiple different models, but that's the span in which they had uh, pop-up headlights. Now, for this example, I believe I picked the rarest one. Online, if you're watching, this is a picture of a 1995 Trans Am. This is not the rarest one, but the one I found as far as uh, Haggerty uh, trends it's the 1997 Pontiac Firebird SLP Firehawk LT4. Apparently, that was the only year that the Firehawk, which is an upgraded version approved by the dealers, uh, that had the Z06 engine in it. A one-year only, and they made like less than 50 of them, 37 or something. That's the one to have. Uh, let's see. The one-year trend is up 5%, and the three-year trend is up 49.1%. So that's a massive 44.1% gap between the one and the three year. Uh, these, I've always thought these were pretty cool. This is the time that I was um, out of college, actually. I'm <laughs> showing my age here. Uh, I always thought they were cool, kind of heavy, but uh, pretty cool cars. All right, next is the Porsche 928. Those were available with pop up headlights from the beginning, 1978, all the way until the end, 1995. Now, I mentioned this in my podcast from last week uh, about um, the record-breaking Porsche 928, and I've got it pulled up here. Uh, this occurred in Monterey. So it's a 1995 last year, Porsche 928 GTS. The numbers on this have gone pretty nuts. One-year trend up 24.2%. Uh, Three-year trend up 35.8%. So you're looking at an 11% gap there. But this one broke the bank, and I don't know if this one is actually in those. They should be in those Haggerty numbers, but maybe not. The estimate was two twenty-five to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and it sold for over four hundred thousand dollars. Now, this is one of just twenty-six U.S. market examples equipped with a five-speed manual transmission in nineteen ninety-five. Very, very rare. Less than seventeen thousand miles on it. Uh, it's really the five-speed and last year production and great shape that made this thing uh, go crazy. All right, next is the Porsche 944. Now these were, I don't actually have a picture of this one, but this was 1982 to 1991. The 1991 Porsche 944 S2, one year trend is up 32%. Three year trend up 60%. So you're looking at a 28% gap between those two years. 
Uh, all right, the next one, I also don't have a picture of it. It's the 1984 to 2005 Toyota MR2. Uh, I believe there's two generations within there. I love the first generation. I almost bought one. It was almost my first car that I ever bought with my own money. It was a 1984, and uh, the guy wanted, I think, $6,500. I had four grand to spend. Had a $2,500 stereo. I asked him if he would take that out and charge me four grand, and he would not. <laughs> so... Uh, let's see, the one-year trend on a 1995 MR2 Mark II Turbo up 27, 23.7%. The three-year trend up 152.2%. So the gap between three-year and one-year, 130-something percent. Really insane. Number one value for these is all the way up to $64,400. All right, next, just a quick note on a couple here. 1997 to 2001 Honda Prelude. Uh, let's see, I chose the 2000 Honda Prelude, Prelude Type SH, one-year trend up 1.3%, three-year trend up 42.7, so a 40% gap between those two. Uh, the other one, I couldn't find anything because it's just not a collectible car. I don't know that it ever will be, is the much unloved Ford Probe that originally was going to replace the Ford Mustang until everyone complained about it. A buddy of mine had one of those in college. He bought it new. It was a pretty little car, but nah, it wasn't really much of a car. All right, next, and I have the picture up online here, is a 1989 to 1995 Lotus Elan. Uh, from a Haggerty Market trend, I have a 1991 Lotus Elan M100. One-year trend flat, three-year trend up 22.7%, so 23% gap between the two. And let's see. All right, let's move on to another cool Japanese car. This is a, let's see, 1978 to 2002 Mazda RX-7. The picture I have online here is what I think are fairly good looking cars. The 1993 Mazda RX-7. For the purposes of the Haggerty market trend, I chose the first generation, a 1984 Mazda RX-7. I had a buddy whose dad had a 78 RX-7. I still think those things are really neat, little cool little cars. One-year trend on the 84 Mazda, up 18.7%. Three-year trend, up 78.7%. So 60% gap between those two. Number one condition, $44,500. All right, quick note from Haggerty on this car. Uh, by the late 1970s, new sports car introductions were a rare event. Sensing the same need that the Nissan had in 1969 for an affordable, reliable, and basic sports car, Mazda rushed to fill the niche that Datsun had abandoned when they, when they took the 240Z up market as the 280ZX. Mazda even had the nerve to invoke the beloved 240Z in the original ads for the RX-7. Mazda in those days was heavily invested into Wankel rotary engine technology, so it was natural that the light, compact, and powerful engine would find a home in Mazda's new sports car. It gave the near, it gave near V8 performance and a lofty, lofty redline, but it also saddled the car with V8 fuel economy levels, which isn't good because you don't have that V8 sound, that torque. Uh, anyways, that's just my opinion. All right, next is another car a friend of mine had in high school. A 1984 to 1988 Pontiac Fiero. Now I have a picture pulled up here. Almost exactly the car my buddy had in high school. 1985 Pontiac Fiero GT. Uh, red. Um, from a market trend perspective, I did pick the best one. And it's when they actually got their act together. And it was actually a pretty good car. The 1988 Pontiac Fiero GT. The one-year trend up 7.1%. The three-year trend up 54.1%. Number one condition, you can pick one of these up for just over $30,000. All right, next, it's a 1984 to 1989 Nissan 300ZX. All right, I got some mediocre pictures online here of a black one. Let's see, I picked the 1989 Nissan 300ZX Turbo for this uh, market trend. One-year trend, flat, 0.0%. Three-year trend, listen up of 128.1%. So 128.1% gap between the three year and the one year. Things are slowing down just a little bit. All right, so that's my review of the pop-up pop headlight cars with market trends. Now I do wanna talk about a little bit more about the fastest cars 
with pop-up headlights ever. Fastest cars ever. Now this is from hotcars.com. This is uh, 10 cars, top 10. We're gonna start at number 10 and count it down. And I will have pictures of these online as well. These are the fast cars. These are the cool cars. All right, these are the cars none of my friends had in high school. All right, number 10, the 1968 to 1973 Ferrari Daytona, top speed, 174 miles per hour. Again, this is all from hotcars.com. I have a gorgeous blue one with tan, tan interior pulled up here online. I'm flipping through the pictures. The Prancing Horse fans remember the high-performance front-engine Ferrari 365 GTB4 by its unofficial nickname, Daytona. It's armed with a 4.4-liter V12 engine, cranking out a massive 352 horses and 317 pound-feet of torque. With immense power under its hood and smooth pinaferina lines, this sports car can achieve a 0-60 to mile-per-hour time in just 5.4 seconds on the way to a top speed of 174 miles per hour. From a market perspective, I didn't pull the trends, but I think this one's going to buck all the market trends, and I think they are at the bottom of the market drought, and they will start appreciating. Why? Because this is a, an iconic, gorgeous front-engine V12 Ferrari that is now selling for under 650 grand, 600 grand, somewhere around there. At one time, they were up to eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars and when you have Dinos, which are gorgeous and great, selling for $900,000, I think it's only a matter of time before the Daytonas go back. There's got to, they got to balance out. Daytonas should always be worth more than Dinos. Dinos right now are one to $200,000 more, the nicest ones, than the Daytonas. So anyone who could pick up a Daytona for 650 or less, in my mind, is getting a steal and they will be well rewarded here shortly. I will not be picking one up anytime soon. If you've been watching online, the one I'm flipping through is pretty cool because it has the Daytona seats, which are were named because of this car, I believe. And it's a right-hand drive, which is really interesting. Did not, didn't really see that before. All right, next, number nine, the 1971 to 1980 Maserati Borla, top speed 177 miles per hour. Maserati's first engine road car, the Borla, is the unsung hero of the 1970s, pop-up headlights and all. It debuted in 1971, and its timing was unfortunate because of the 1973 oil crisis. Its sales tanked much before it could, get, could gear up to take its mid-engine rivals head-on. These are pretty cars, uh, somewhat uh, fly under the radar. I don't know about their quality issues, honestly, in the 70s. I know Top Gear famously did a review of some of these cheaper Italian marks, and uh, they beat this one up pretty bad, but I think the one they had was like eight years old. Now, let's see. The Maserati Borla came powered by two powerful engines, a 4.7 liter V8 cranking out 310 horses and a bigger 4.9 liter V8 churning out 320 ponies. That's a lot of horsepower for back then. The latter went off like a rocket when the engine was fired for a six second zero to 60 mile per hour spin with a remarkable top speed of 177 miles an hour. That was very fast for the time frame that these were uh, were sold new. All right, next we're gonna talk vectors again, not the W8, but we're gonna talk about the M12 made from 1996 to 1999. Uh, if you missed my vector special before, um, I did tour the Vector plant where the M12s were made, and you can go on YouTube and see the pictures, which are horrible, that I took of the Vector plant as the first cars were being built. Uh, this very car I'm showing online right now might be in one of those pictures. And uh, see them being built in the actual factory. They only made 14 of these. Uh, to me, they're not nearly as attractive as the first gen. That looks like a Mako shark. To me, this one looks more like a whale shark especially from the front. Uh, top speed, 190 miles an hour. The Vector M12 used a Lamborghini Diablo sourced 5.7 liter V12 to pump up out a massive 492 horses and 425 pound-feet of torque with cool pop-up headlights. It propelled the M12 for a stunning 4.8 second, zero to 60 mile per hour result, and the car topped out at 190 miles an hour. However, it couldn't match Diablo's speed. It's a rare sports car with only 14 of them ever produced. 
between 1996 and 1999. This cool piece of American automotive history fetches six figures in the car collector's bazaar. Yeah, these are they are cool. Actually, we have the famous red, white, and blue Statue of Liberty one here in Cincinnati, as well as uh, one of the yellow ones. So we got two of the 14 vectors M12s uh, here in Cincinnati. All right, next is number seven, the 1991 to 1994 Ferrari 512TR. Top speed, 195 miles an hour. The Pininfarina design Ferrari Testarossa was a legendary car with distinguishing sharp lines. The 512TR replaced the Testarossa in 1991, but kept its flat 12 mil and intense design language, including its pop-up headlights. It's a mid-engine touring machine that's got a 4.9 liter flat 12 thrashing out 422 horses for a 4.8 second 0 to 60 mile per hour time on the way to a top speed of 195 miles an hour. The powerful engine has made it to an updated version of the 5-speed manual transmission that comes from Testarossa for these astonishing results. These are really pretty. I like Testarossas. I like the 512 TR uh, just that much more. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cool looking little car. All right, next, number six of 10. All right, one of your favorites, one of my favorites. We all know and love it. The 1987 to 1992 Ferrari F40, top speed 201 miles per hour. Now the picture I have online here is of, uh, let's see, 1990 F40 that is being sold at RM Sotheby's Miami sale next week. So if you're interested, the estimate on this one is three to $3.5 million. All right, all 1980s born gearheads know that the pop-up headlight wearing Ferrari F40 was a sensational sensation back then. Remembered as one of the fastest Ferraris of its era, the F40 can finish the zero to 60 mile per hour milestone in just 3.8 seconds on the way to a record-breaking top speed of 201 miles per hour. So I do have a picture pulled up where the headlights are popped up. It does look better with them down, uh, but it's pretty iconic. It is such such a cool car. All right, flip through. Oh yeah, they got some great shots of these these pop-up headlights here. Very, very nice. Yeah, most of these pictures were taken at night, hence they gotta have the pop-up headlights. All right, next is the 1995 to 1998 Lamborghini Diablo VT. Uh, top speed, 204 miles per hour. Now, the pictures I have here online are from RM Sotheby's Scottsdale auction coming up in January. This is a beautiful silver with black interior and chrome wheel. Wheels, 1999 Lamborghini Diablo VT Roadster. Estimate on this one's 425 to 475. Just absolutely stunning. With a top speed of 204 miles per hour, the Diablo is remembered for being the first Lamborghini to beat the 200 mile per hour milestone. Diablo VT uses a 5.7 liter mill to churn out a massive 492 horsepower and 428 pound-feet of torque, pound-feet of torque, same as the Vector, for a blazing 4.4 second 0 to 60 mile per hour sprint. I think, you know, I love Countach's, um, but everything I've read and talked to owners about between, the difference between the Countach and the Diablo are just absolutely insane. The Diablo is a much better car to drive on a frequent basis. And honestly, it is beautiful. I absolutely love the Countach, but I think the uh, Diablo is absolutely gorgeous. One of the most pretty, one of the prettiest designs ever made. Um, anyways, really, really cool. Speaking of Diablos, this next car is gonna look a little bit familiar because I believe it had the same designer. So when you're looking at it, you could squint your eyes and see the lines of a uh, Diablo in it. Now, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but it's the 1991 to 1995 Cizetta Moroder, Moroder V16T, top speed 204 miles per hour. Now I've actually seen two of these in my life. I think they only made 11 of them, not many of them, and yet I've seen two of them. The pictures online here are from uh, the Scottsdale auction for RM Sotheby's this year, which is where I saw this one. Uh, let's see, this one is a big media Italian bowl of a car, and so was its retail price, about $650,000 in 1991. As the name suggests, 
It was also the world's first V16 powered production sports car. Two Lamborghini Yuraco sorts, Yuraco sorts flat plane V8s were assembled to create the 6 liter V16 power plant that was made it to a 5 speed manual transmission. The result was 540 horses and 400 pound feet of torque, and more importantly, a 4.4 second 0 to 60 mile per hour success, hitting a top speed of 204 miles per hour. Dual pop up headlights also added a certain allure. So I just pulled those out. They're actually two sets of he pop up headlights stacked on top of each other, which is really weird. If you think uh, they look bad with one set, it actually looks worse with two. Very weird. All right. So this is interesting. Uh, we just talked about the Diablo being the first time that Lamborghini was able to eclipse the 200 mile marker. Well, our next example, number three, at least on this list, is an earlier Lamborghini, but with a twist. So the 1984 Lamborghini Countach Turbo. Now the picture I have online is our Lamborghini, uh, 1986 regular Lamborghini Countach LP 5000. Uh, estimate on this one is 600 to 700 grand. It's being sold at our Miami Beach auction next week. It's got the best color combo, in my mind, red with the gold wheels, with the phone dial gold wheels. Absolutely wonderful. It looks fantastic. You wouldn't think there's pop-up headlights there, but they're hidden in there. But what's going on with this turbo? Because I don't remember there being a turbo Countach. And uh, if you don't remember that either, you would be right. So top speed was 208 miles per hour. All right, the Countach is the ultimate poster car for the 1970s and 1980s, uh, more so because of those pop-up headlights. Now, I'd never care for the headlights, but that's okay. Officially, Lamborghini never put a turbocharged Countach on the platter, but a Lamborghini distributor named Max Bob Bobnar transformed two of them for fun, an LP400 S trim and an LP500 S trim were twin turbocharged. So this one really shouldn't be on this list, but we'll leave it on there for now. The result was so fast and insane that at the time it was considered unsafe for road use. The stock 4.8 liter V12 cranked out 748 horses and 646 pound feet of torque. The zero to 60 time was 3.7 seconds and the car maxed out an at an astonishing 208 miles per hour. So yeah, really, really insane. I uh, really shouldn't be on this list, but it is. All right, if you're online, you can see the pop-up headlights on the car that's being sold at RM Sotheby's uh, Miami sale on December the 10th. All right, we have two more to go. Two more interesting ones here. All right, number two is the 1992 to 1994 Jaguar XJ220. Top speed, 212 miles per hour. Now, the one I have online is a gorgeous, kind of like a dark, dark brownish maroon 1993 Jaguar XJ220 that was recently sold at our Monterey sale. And it was the first time I'd ever seen one of these in this color. All right, the estimate on that one was 450 to 550 and it sold for 566. This early 1990s Jag was one of the fastest production cars of its time. It clocked the zero to 60 mile per hour time in just 3.6 seconds and recorded a top speed of 212 miles per hour. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, I thought they actually went faster than that. And you would be right. When armed with unrestricted catalytic converters, it logged 217 miles per hour, making it the fastest car for that year. Now, if you go way back in my podcast episodes, you go, uh, had an episode called the fastest car from every decade. I believe this actually was the fastest car for the 1990s. I have to go back and check that one out. Anyways, what's interesting about these is called the XJ220 because Jaguar thought it would go 220 miles per hour, but it never did. So it should be called the XJ212, which actually doesn't sound that bad. 217, uh, if you got to take off the catalytic converters, doesn't really count. Uh, anyways, so uh, that is our number two car. Sorry, I'm getting distracted here by looking at these pictures. Uh, all right, number one, and we've already talked about this car once, and we're going to talk about it again. The 1990 to 1993 Vector W8, top speed 242 miles an hour. I don't know if that was actually really tested, but it's number one on this list. So I have a red one pulled up, 1992 Vector W8 Twin Turbo online. 
Let's see, with the W8, Vector was ready to lock horns with the likes of Lamborghini and Ferrari in the early 1990s. The W8, uh, let's see, the W8 was Gerald Weigert's uh, pet project, so he stuffed his entire life into this car. Again, I don't need to review these again, but they're just absolutely amazing, stunning, beautiful cars. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of, that was all about pop-up headlights. I never thought I would do an episode like this, but you folks seem to like it. So I will keep churning these out. If you have a topic you would like for me to cover, please shoot me a note. Greg at the CollectorCarPodcast.com. Uh, I've got a lot of fun stuff I'm covering here in the next few weeks. Um, I appreciate you listening, watching, and following, sharing. And uh, I will talk to all of you next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.